Welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. No one is beyond help. No one is beyond hope. As we have always said, we are bringing you medical information and cutting edge science, but none of this is medical advice. Please seek out input from your own doctor. Hello and welcome to the Low Carb MD Podcast. Troll, we got a smart one here. We're gonna start take. I'm gonna, I should get my pen. And start taking notes here. So good to see you, man. How are you doing, Troll? Uh, I'm doing really good. I'm I'm excited about this, guys. It's uh, you know we we're the Low Carb MD Podcast, but we are not. We try not to be myopic. We try to hear brilliant voices uh, in science so that we can learn. And today we have one of the most brilliant voices in science. In obesity uh, research, uh, I, we were just joking off the air that basically he got his PhD when I was in my diapers. Um, and this is Dr. John Speakman. Uh, and you have probably heard of his research and uh, you probably know about him. Um, he's from the University of Aberdeen. Uh, he has a, a clinical uh, lab there. He also has a clinical lab in China. Um, he's been, he's, got a number of amazing discoveries in the field of obesity uh, medicine. Just to name a few, he's put out theories of something called the thrifty gene. Maybe we'll talk about it. He's looked into the relationship with obesity in the FTO gene. Uh, you know, we'll talk about it. Uh, he's looked at the variability of uh, animals' response to different diets. Um, he's been inducted as a fellow of uh, the American Association of Advancement of Science, also a fellow of the Royal Society, also inducted into the Chinese National Academy of Sciences, and also a member of the, just recently uh, elected as a member of the US National Academy of Sciences. If this, if this doesn't give you an idea of the type of person he is, is a lifelong servant to obesity science and obesity research. So, Dr. Speakman, we are very happy to have you here, very honored to have you here, and uh, we're hoping to learn a lot about uh, obesity that we don't, don't already know, and hopefully at some point we can talk about your most recent op-ed um, with Dr. Kevin Hall, which uh, maybe criticizes or expands uh, the CIM model. Uh, so one, thank you for coming. Two, thank you for stooping your level to uh, two lowly internists like me and Brian. Um, we're very happy to have you here. So thanks very much for the invite and also uh, thanks for doing this at a time that's not usual for you guys. I know you kind of moved a day to accommodate me. So that was really nice. I'm in China at the moment, so it's like 9 p.m. here. And, but uh, I appreciate Brian's up at 6 a.m. And so uh, it's great to... Uh, finally talk to you person to person and I'm very happy to share stuff that I know and admit stuff that I don't know so uh, that's great yeah you know it's it's funny a lot of times people see may see an adversarial nature online and they may not understand how much deep respect there may be um, just because we may agree disagree on you know some minor details about the science doesn't mean we can't have a mutual respect. So I'm going to start off by saying there's an immense amount of mutual respect. Uh, okay, I've been right. following your work for a very long time. Can you talk about how you got started? So, you know, I, we always love to hear about, um, you know, what inspired somebody. I mean, clearly you've dedicated your life to obesity research and science. What got you started down this pathway? So actually, I started as a, an animal ecophysiologist. So I didn't start out in obesity research. I did my uh, undergraduate in biology. And in my final year, I went to a university in Scotland. And Scottish universities are quite uh, unique in the UK in that it's a four-year degree rather than a three-year degree. And in the last year, you spend most of your time doing a, a research project. So I was extremely interested in bird watching at the time. And I'd uh, sort of had this ambition to work with a guy at the university to, to do some stuff related to bird watching. And he introduced me to uh, measuring energy expenditure. So that was my first ever 
kind of experience was 1979, putting birds in little boxes and measuring how much energy they expend. So that was a real eye opener for me because energy balance and energy expenditure turned out to be something that was pretty interesting. And I was quite keen to use that as a tool to try and understand things about animals. So I ended up staying at the same university doing a PhD with the same guy and applying principles of energy balance to try and understand behaviors that we observe in birds in, in the wild. So basically I would go down every day to these horrible bleak mud flats where there's wading birds and I would watch what they did, what they ate, and then back in the lab, I would be measuring their energy expenditure and things like that. So then when I finished my PhD, I continued working on animals. I went to University of Aberdeen and I started working on bats using the same kind of approach, using the same kind of principles. And I did maybe about five years work on bats. And then it was time for me to get a faculty position. And I, I by that time I'd acquired ability to use this doubly leveled water technique. And so I was quite uh, an unusual person because at that point there'd only been uh, a real handful of measurements that had been made with doubly leveled water. The first study in humans had only been published in 1982. So I was right at the kind of start of that field. And so there was an opportunity at Aberdeen for me to continue in, in a faculty position. So I kind of leapt at that opportunity. But it became pretty clear pretty quickly that getting money to work on animals is quite difficult. So if you want to work on, you know, why bats echolocate and, and why, you know, what the energy cost of flight is and how many insects they have to eat. That's a tough sell to a research council where there's competing proposals that are saying, I'm going to work out, you know, how people age and I'm going to work out the, you know, reasons for obesity. So in the late nineties, I kind of decided that if I was going to continue as a scientist, I really had to change the direction of what I was doing. So I then put in research grants because I had those techniques available. I put in research grants to start looking at energy balance in humans. And I took a half-time position in uh, 2000 at the Rowett Institute, which is a nutrition research institute in Aberdeen. So at that point, I was 50% of my time in Aberdeen, sorry, in Aberdeen University and 50% of my time in the Rowett Institute. And I sort of ran the metabolic health obesity section for about five years. And that, that was a kind of interesting experience uh, because I started uh, you know, doing measurements on humans. So that was a very new kind of experience for me. And I uh, also expanded into working on laboratory animals and doing lots of work with laboratory animals. So one thing that I discovered also is that I really don't like administration work. So I uh, was on the management board for the Rowett Institute, but I really just didn't like that side of the job at all. I left the Rowett in 2005, and uh, because people in that sort of position, that sort of stage of their life, you've got no option but to do more management stuff. So I became director of institute in the University of Aberdeen, Institute of Biological Sciences. And so I had that job for a while, but I was always kind of looking for opportunities to escape. And I'd set up a collaboration with some guys in China. And one day I was taking a flight across China and I'd been going back and forwards there, you know, maybe about two, three months a year doing work. And uh, I took a flight and, and the guy that I was working with said, you know, you don't have to do it this way. What you could do is you could come and work in China nine months of the year and just go back to Aberdeen for three months. And I got kind of intrigued by that possibility that, you know, that would be a complete change in my life, but I could also escape all this admin work. And uh, so I applied for that position and I got it and I moved to Beijing in 2011. So actually, uh, probably, yeah, actually yesterday was my 10th anniversary in China. So I just moved there on the 11th of August in 2011 and then 
I stayed in Beijing until last year. And then in the middle of the pandemic, I moved my lab from Beijing to Shenzhen, which is uh, on the opposite side of the bay from Hong Kong. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of opportunities down in Shenzhen. And what I wanted to do, which I've always kind of had the ambition to do, was to set up my own uh, clinical research center where we can bring people in and we can feed them different diets and we can do lots of experimental manipulations on human volunteers to match all the work that we've done on mice. So that's kind of my ambition and I've just managed to achieve that now. So we've just set up phase one of that lab and then phase two of that lab will be open by the end of this year. And then I'll start doing uh, manipulation studies in humans. So instead of just talking about the carb carbohydrate insulin model, I'll actually be doing experiments on it as well. That actually sounds very exciting uh, to move kind of predominantly from, uh, from animals to humans. I can tell you as somebody who deals with humans very often, um, it's, it's a, an immense privilege. It's such an immense privilege. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think so, but it's also an immense difficulty because actually humans can decide not to take part in the experiments. The nice thing about mice is they have no choice about being in the experiment and you can control exactly what they do and they don't cheat. And, you know, it's uh, going to be an eye opener, I think. Although, I, I mean, I have had this link through the Rowett Institute with uh, doing experiments in humans. I think shifting to do most of my time with humans is going to be new for me. I think that's going to be really amazing. Um, so I, I'd like to kind of come back. I mean, clearly, um, uh, just a, an incredible career, and I am so excited to hear about what what comes out of this clinic. I wanted I wanted to come back to uh, energy balance. Uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Ben Bickman, you know, we had a discussion, and he said uh, he made a comment. He said. And I, I find that a lot of times uh, people in the carbohydrate, uh, low carbohydrate I saw it. camp. I saw his comment online that it, right, the introduction okay. of the calorie was the biggest mistake in the history of nutrition. Yeah, I, and I think he meant it. I, and I, I, think, I know Ben is such a gentle, amazing, nice guy. And I think the way I can't, I, I don't mean to exactly say what he meant it, but I agree, I agree with him. I, I, I mean it in the terms of be managing human behavior, you know, not, not in finding, discovering things about science, because, you know, you, you did some amazing work on the variation of a uh, uh, response to a high fat diet in mice. And I, and I hope you'll talk about it where you were able to find out sure. the different amount of calories those mice burned, the different amount of calories they took in, they, they ate. Right. And uh, the different amount of, you know, uh, the way they were active, whether they were active at night or in the in the day. And um, so from a scientist perspective, being able to measure these things, I think it's a, a miraculous thing. But when you trends, when you translate to human behavior management, right, which is what I consider me and Brian doing. Uh, I don't know, Brian, if you'd agree, you know. Uh, I, I find that we're in human behavior management, helping people make behavior change. I, I see no evidence that the calorie has helped, you know? And so yeah, and can I'm, you help? You know, I, I'm that? not going to deny that that's, that's the case. I mean, I think the problem is that people, you know, as, as a tool to help people change their behavior, telling them to reduce the calories is, is a difficult thing to implement because generally people are not very clear what calories are. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, information and knowledge about that. And, and people don't know how much energy they spend. They don't know how many calories they're spending. So actually to, uh, to use that as a tool to change the behavior is actually quite difficult. We did some work way back in Aberdeen where we just went out onto the street and we asked people, we had like 12 pictures and we asked people how many calories there were in each of those things. And the answers were just unbelievable, you know? So you would have something like, uh, like an apple, you know, say it's got 60 calories. And the answers range from two to like 2000, you know? So, so when the level of knowledge is like that, it's impossible to say to people, okay, what, what you should do is you should go away and you should count how many calories you're eating and then match that off against how many calories you're expending. So I think it's, it's a much easier, 
task if you're trying to manage human behavior to say to people, it would be good for you if you cut all the carbohydrates out of your diet, or as I would kind of tend to prefer, you cut out all the fat from your diet. But whatever you're going to say to people, I think it's a lot easier to give them a message like that than to use calories as a tool. But when it comes down to it, the reason that they're going to lose weight is because of a calorie imbalance. So if you want to understand it from a scientific point of view, then understanding the calorie balance is absolutely essential. Yeah, I think that's yeah. an important topic. And I think both sides get lost in the weeds. I think like the low carb keto intermittent fasting people are saying, look, it's hormonal mostly. So you get the hormones right, the appetite corrects itself. However, there are people who say, I eat all the time when I'm not hungry, or I get stressed, my husband yells at me, and I want to eat cookies, right, even though they're really trying to do the right thing. And so on the low carb keto side, I see a lot of people saying calories don't matter. I've heard you say it, Tro, and we've debated a little bit, calories don't matter. Well, if you're trying to control your calories, it's very difficult. But if you naturally control your calories, so I have people all the time now come and say, I'm just not hungry anymore. I eat twice a day instead of eating seven times a day. I'm not snacking all night. You know, so Fine. that's what I'm seeing the satiety thing. But for some, I, but I, I think ultimately what we're going to find is it's not a one size fits all. Some people go on a higher fat diet and they say, I have satiety twice a day and they're eating less calories based on that. Other people eat a high protein diet and say, I feel great. I cut out fat and, you know, like a Ted Naiman type diet and they do great. Uh, but I don't think one dietary approach is going to work for everyone. I think it's, it's, there's individual hormonal and, and uh, genetic variabilities that are gonna, going to play. So well, oh, a, if somebody eats 10,000 calories here. of yeah, butter I, every yeah, day, they're not going to lose segue. weight. Even a low protein diet, right? You just did a study on mice, Dr. Speakman, right? Yeah. Where even a low protein diet. So I, when I saw that, can you talk about that? Because we're talking about individual variability, yeah, we're talking right. about calorie intake. I was so surprised by the study uh, because- Okay, so the... what, what happened was we did, we did a study about three years ago uh, that was this enormous diet study. So basically what we did was we were interested in what macronutrients do to body weight and how that's controlled and what happens to food intake. So we designed this matrix of 24 diets that varied in protein content, carbohydrate content, and fat content. And then we fed that to a thousand mice. And worked out what the things were that, that were controlling the, the control of body weight. And one of the main things that we wanted to test with that was this protein leverage idea. So the idea that Steve Simpson and David Robenheimer came up with, that the reason that you overeat calories is actually because you're not eating food for calories, you're eating food for protein. And so what happens is, as you reduce the percent protein in the diet, you have to eat more of it in order to get the amount of protein that you need. So if I give you a diet with 20% protein, you eat a certain amount of food. If I give you a, a diet with only 10% protein, to get the same amount of protein, you're going to eat twice as much of it. So that was the kind of framework that we were trying to test in part of that experiment. And I, I thought it was a really nice idea. And I was super keen to do it because I know Steve Simpson really well. And I thought, okay, We'll do that experiment. It'll come out that protein leverage is important and we'll just kind of publish that. But it turned out it wasn't. So basically what happened was we shifted the protein levels from 30 to 25 to 20 to 15 to 10 to five and nothing happened. It was just completely flatlined. So the food intake was flat. The energy expenditure was flat. The body composition was flat. There was nothing happening at all. And we took the brains out of the animals, we looked at the gene expression in all the hunger signaling pathways, nothing was going on. So basically, it, it was just that. It was just flat protein leverage didn't seem to explain anything. But there was one little kind of thing that, that always kind of bugged me when I looked at the data. And that was, when you looked at it, it was kind of flat as you went from 30 all the way down. But in all the animals, so we did four different strains of mice, in all four different strains, at five, it ticked up. So it was, you know, it wasn't like there was a continuous increase in food intake, but just as you got right to the bottom level where we were looking at at 5%, there was an uptick in the intake. Now it didn't, it wasn't significant. It didn't translate to any increase in, in body weight and fatness. It didn't change energy expenditure, but it was always there. And so, I had a student who was interested in doing a new project. And I said, look, why don't we take this 
uptick at five and just take it further. Let's try lower diets. Let's try two and a half percent or one percent protein and see whether what happens when you get down to these super low levels is you get a big upswing in the intake. So student goes away and, and we make the diet so we get it all set up and the experiments all, all going fine. But actually what we found was completely the opposite. So a completely serendipitous finding that actually what happened was when you put the mice on this 1% protein diet, even if they have 60% fat in their diet or they have 80% carbohydrate in their diet, they lose almost all their body fat. So it just disappears almost completely. They also lose quite a bit of lean tissue, but the predominant thing, I mean, there's ways that you can express this relative loss of different components of the body, but what they're basically doing is they're extracting all the fat from their bodies. And that was really unexpected, but I think pretty interesting. I mean, it, it was a, a kind of interesting finding. So, so what we did then was look to try and find out what the mechanism was, what's, what's happening. So, because when you don't know what the mechanism is, we thought it was probably something happening in the brain that was regulating the food intake that had been interrupted. So the first thing we looked at was the main hunger signaling neuropeptides. So there's four neuropeptides in the brain, in the hypothalamus that are related to hunger, the MPY and AGRP, which stimulate food intake and POMC and, and CART, which inhibit it. So what I thought was happening was maybe, okay, we checked that the leptin levels and the insulin levels were, were fine and they were just exactly where you'd expect them to be for the level of body fat. So what might be happening is when those insulin and leptin signals come into the brain, what we thought was, okay, maybe the low fat does something that interferes with them switching on these hunger pathways. So we looked at those genes and they were completely as you would have expected if the animals had been calorie restricted. So then we thought, well, okay, I wonder what happens if, you know, you put them on this 1% protein diet. If you take them off that diet, they should be hungry because they've got all those signals in the brain that we expect telling them you're really hungry. You should eat a ton of food. And what happens if you put a mouse on calorie restriction? If you put it on calorie restriction for three months, you take it off that diet. It goes through this massive hyperphagia. So for the about three, four days after you take it off the diet, it goes through this hyperphagia. So what I thought would happen is the low protein guys would do exactly the same. They would come down on this sort of no body fat. They're eating less food than, than, they, than they need. So what should happen is they've got all those signals in their brain saying you're hungry. We give them the 20% protein food. They should eat a ton of it. And they didn't. They didn't even, you know, they just went back up to the level at the ones that had never been restricted. So something was happening in the brain, but it was happening downstream of that main signaling pathway. So what we did was RNA-seq, which you be familiar with is a, a way of looking at the gene expression of everything that's going on in the brain at the same time. So we sort of did that analysis and, and it turned out there were two big pathways that would be implicated in that. So one of them, was the EIF2 signaling pathway, which is sensitive to levels of amino acids. So absolutely obvious that should be affected. And the other pathway was mTOR, which is also a sort of classical affected by levels of protein pathway. So then we did a whole lot of viral manipulations in the brain. So basically what you can do is you can create a virus that you can put into the hypothalamus and you can overexpress these things and look at what's happening. And what we showed was that the reduction in mTOR, we could mimic by putting in something that interfered with its downstream signaling and that mimicked the effect. So it was clear that mTOR was the thing. And if we did the same manipulation with EIF2, we didn't get the effect. So basically what we showed then was that the low protein was affecting mTOR and mTOR was then somehow coming in after these main neuropeptides and stopping the animals from getting hungry. So I thought, okay, if that's true, what we should be able to do then is take the animals, put them on a 20% diet that's pair fed to the 1% guys, 
And then for the last week that they're on that diet, we'll give them rapamycin. So rapamycin will inhibit the mTOR and that should stop them getting hungry and stop them uh, you know, going through this hyperphagia at the, at the end of the diet. And that's exactly what happened. So when we put these mice on a calorie restricted diet and we gave them rapamycin, we could block the hunger. And so they didn't go through this hyperphagia. And I think that now becomes a kind of suitable strategy, probably not using rapamycin because there are issues with rapamycin, but mTOR inhibitors in the hypothalamus could be a really a good adjunct therapy for reducing the hunger that develops when people go on low calorie diets. So that was the kind of outcome of, of that work. I want to apply a clinical correlation here and maybe tell me if okay. my thinking is right or maybe it's wrong. Uh, you know, anecdotally speaking, when people go on a full fast, like uh, basically not eating, they report significant decreases in hunger after day two, right? And, but if people go on a protein sparing modified fast, you know, where they're interested in, you know, eating a certain amount of protein, whether it's a protein shake or bone broth or very lean uh, meat, um, they do not report a decrease in hunger. In fact, I find that they're more hungry. Right. In fact, the people who fast completely are report like they like, and this is the danger of, you know, it's not a danger, but one of the dangers I find is if somebody gets to a day two of a fast, they like want to keep going because they have zero hunger. Did you ever do it? Have I done it? Yes. Have, have do I do it? So how patients? far did you Very get? Low. Cause I, I tried it and uh, I didn't experience any sort of lack of hunger after day two for sure. And by day four, my head was just completely pounding. So I, I had to pack it in. Yeah. So, well, there's salt, you know, the, the, well, salt requirements and stuff like that. I've, I, you know, at least once a, once a year, I'll do a three day fast personally. Oh, really? Uh, wow. Yeah. And um, uh, very frequently, uh, but uh, as a, you know, I've shared this on the podcast, uh, you know, I started, you know, I was a young kid, you know, 12 years old with a family of obesity. Uh, I was obese myself, and um, you know, it's funny you wrote that paper, the familial resemblance of obesity. Uh, we were told it's you know a genetic issue. Um, to this day, I would go to my grave and say it's a hunger issue, uh, not a genetic issue. Yeah, but and, of course, uh, hunger can be genetics as well. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Uh, and I, I, I certainly see that. But uh, you know, I, I. You know, I, I've shared this that uh, at one point I didn't eat for two weeks as a young kid. Wow. And I didn't want I didn't want to stop because it was it was it, there was no hunger, zero hunger. And, you wow. know, I eventually went vegan and uh, had a lifetime of ups and downs in my diet throughout medical school and residency, uh, trying to battle obesity and uh, really put low. I, I, I was like. I was the most low fat supporter you'd imagine all throughout my training. Um, and I didn't, you know, I, I didn't come into this with a low carb bias. Uh, but when that hunger signal went away with uh, low carb and particularly intermittent fasting, um, it made me very, you know, very much a supporter. But in any case, when I saw this study that you wrote, uh, that you, that you wrote up with this low protein, you know, I've, I, I very much like uh, that high protein approach that you've talked about, all these proponents, but I think they're chinks in the armor. I could overeat protein very easily uh, and it won't affect sure. my hunger. Uh, and when you showed that, hey, this low protein through mTOR uh, may have some important findings in terms of hunger, it made me think, wow, this is the data on fasting that I think we've been seeing clinically. This is the magic, uh, so to speak. So, so it's pretty interesting because, we, of course, we didn't do a zero percent protein because the remember the reason we were doing the experiment was because I thought it would extend that increase in the food intake. So two and a half percent should make it even more, one percent should make it even more, but zero didn't make any sense in that experiment. So I kind of wish that I'd, I'd kind of you know they should they should really. Uh, there's no prediction for what would happen if you take protein completely out because there's no protein leverage. So you can't test the protein leverage with a 0% protein. But I kind of wish that we'd, we'd, we'd just done that anyway, just to sort of see what, see what happened. The problem is, I mean, 
as soon as we got that result, you know, the, it's the reduction in the fat in these guys is astonishing compared to if you take an animal on a 20% protein diet and 60% fat, you know, it's, it's just enormous. So I thought, you know, that's, that's it. You know, what we need to do is put people on 1% protein diets, but actually there is no possible diet with 1% protein. There are no foods that contain so little protein. It's just impossible to do it. Chocolate, ice cream, you know, uh, or we can make it. Yeah. Trust me, Nestle will make it, right? I think uh, <laughs> they'll come up with it. You know what, what, what I find, and may, you know, Brian, maybe we could talk about this. When you look at the Yale Food Addiction Scale, and if you look at their foods on their kind of top 10 list, they're all devo void of protein. I think the problem in human food, uh, when you lower protein, you go to hyper palatable, great tasting, um, you know, uh, just amazing food that are carb fat combinations. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's probably just because you have to put other things in there. So once you, once you start piling both fat and, and, and carbohydrate together, then that's that's the deadly combination. That's that's what's going to make people fat. Yeah, well, which is so that's 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 in contrast to what the animal studies show. So I think there's there may be something different to human behavior and, and human engineering, food engineering, right? So I'm not like so that. sure the animal studies are so different. So basically, we this 24 diet matrix experiment that we did. We took the fat levels up to about uh, 80%. We didn't take carbs below 10%. So, so we were kind of, there were edges around that data. And over the range that we looked at with fat, the body weight was kind of going up. But once you got above 60% fat, it was starting to go down again. So the latest stuff that we've done is really just put mice on extremely low carbohydrate diets to see where that curve goes. And basically what happens is it goes back down again. So the issue that you have then in, in mice is that, you know, this is, this is kind of like uh, that paper we said that dietary fat is the thing that regulates the, the food intake. And across the range that we did, that seemed to be predominantly the case. But if you look at a wider range, then what happens is as you increase the fat content, then they go up, but then as you go above 60%, they actually go back down again. So once you get down to like 1% carbohydrate in the diet, they're almost back down to what they are when you've got 10% carbo, uh, sorry, 10% fat in the diet. So there's clearly that peaked relationship, which I think is exactly the same thing that's going on in humans. I don't think the mouse is really that different than, it, than a human is. Yeah, you know, I've always uh, found it interesting that I'm a, I'm an extreme person. I found uh, a lot of times the focus on energy balance takes away from maybe the unique effects of the macronite, macronutrient extremes. And I think there's some magic on a very low fat diet, right? You, you, you're unpaid. It's like try to overeat baked potato. It's impossible. It's very hard, right? But the minute you add a little bit of butter, right? right. You can, you can eat a lot more. Right. In fact, yeah. you know, if you ask the average person, they could eat three potatoes worth of French fries. So that's, no that's problem. yeah, that's salad with salad dressing. Bingo. It's exactly yeah. the same thing. As soon as you put oily dressing on it, you, you can eat more of it. So I, I, the flip my side feeling is, true, is though, that, you know, like nobody's going to drink the vat of oil, you know, nobody's going to just eat the salad dressing. Right. So, right. you know, there, yeah, there's so, some so magic I mean, I there. That, that, that I think is the absolute key. And, and so where the sort of, you know, where the problems happen is, you know, if you go from a diet that has got a large amount of this lethal mix of carbs and, and fat, if you then cut out the carbs, you're moving into a zone where it's easier to regulate your body weight. And I think the, the problem is that people look back on that time and say, the problem was the carbs. And you can understand that because that's what they've cut out. They cut out the carbs, so the carbs must have been the problem. But actually, it wasn't the carbs that was the problem. It was the combination that was the problem. So I think the, the issue then becomes when people extrapolate back further, you end up with these ridiculous sort of ideas that, okay, if you eat fruit, which is mostly carbs and, and not got any fat in it, that's the worst thing of all. 
you know, and I think that's that's wrong because you've gone back over the curve now and actually you're getting thin again. So fruit is a good thing to eat because it's not got that lethal combination of, of carbs and fat. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, well, I've thought well, a lot about that. Yeah, I've I think. i thought a lot about that. Go, go ahead, ahead, Brian. No, you know, I'm okay. thinking like one of the famous weight loss, they went to fruit was free and people could eat as much fruit as they could. And all of a sudden now they're getting a lot of diabetes. They're having orange juice and they're having, you know, tons of stuff now you got a problem metabolically because this is where i think the intersection comes in is that there's a difference between how, spiking your insulin all the time and your stress hormones um rather than keeping them balanced so what i find in my practice if someone's for me i could tell you from my experience i was drinking green smoothies every morning and i was gaining weight working out six days a week and sure, i said sure what is going on sure. here? so i'm talking about fruit rather than the juice of the fruit yeah, we're just, but when, when you say fruits, when, when people say fruits free, they go, well, orange juice must be great too. So they're drinking highly concentrated sugar, basically, sure, right? Sure. When naturally you yeah. wouldn't be doing that. And so, and the other thing that just along those lines, in my career, I've never seen anyone do a uh, liquid diet, 500 calories a day and sustain weight loss. I've seen them lose a ton of weight, but non-sustainable, you know, and now in our clinical experience, what we're seeing here is I have people that I've been working with for two years, three years, sustaining weight loss doing what yeah. we're doing so now. so i mean i think that's that's super interesting because when you go off the top of this curve to these edges you seem to get different phenomena happening and i think the interesting thing i mean i've i've tried low carb a long time ago when it was was atkins you don't feel hungry when you're on that diet whereas when you go to low fat you do feel hungry and that's that's i think a, a really interesting difference between those two extremes but that doesn't, that doesn't mean that you can't lose weight on a low fat diet. I think it's just much harder to, to sustain it because of that developing hunger. And that's why I think this sort of interruption with that mTOR pathway may be a route to kind of allow people to go for a low fat diet, but still, you know, get over the hunger problem so that they can stay on the diet for much longer. You know, I, I want to talk about fruit. I, I did a self experiment on fruit. I ate, um, I ate meat until I was full. Uh, this was at my parents' house. Uh, this, this was not too long ago. And I was satiated. I was completely satiated. Um, I was full. I had, maybe I had like, I don't know, a thousand calories of meat for the day. And that was my intake. Right. And uh, they brought out dessert. And this is a, you know, berries are a keto friendly option. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, and they also brought out some watermelon and uh Upon eating that watermelon, right? Upon eating, putting just one piece into my mouth, right? That, that different sensation and a different taste literally erased any satiety I had. My belly was full, right? Sure, my belly but that's, was full. I mean, that's yeah. sensory specific satiety, isn't it? I mean, Bingo. that's why you have yeah. desserts at the end of a meal because you couldn't yeah. eat any more of the main meal, but you can eat something different. Well, here's the thing. So I did another experiment where I said, let me try this again. This really interests me. I agree with you. Sensory specific satiety. We talk about that very often. And I said, let me so try. So did you do it the other way? Uh, so, oh, you ate no, the fruit first? Oh, no, no, I haven't. I'm, I'm sure that I would eat. I'm sure that I would eat. What I did was I tried the same fruit, same exact thing, right? Uh, it was the berries. And I did it unripened. I was like, I'm going to try to eat and to see if it does anything. And it did absolutely nothing. It did absolutely nothing. And it's the same amount of nutrients, right? I mean, the nutrients don't really change, right? Same amount of carbohydrates, but that sweet taste, you know, um, had an amazing impact on my hunger. And so I, I don't sure. think it's as simple as carbohydrates. It's definitely not, right? There's so many differing things here at play. Um, and then how do you take that, you know, how can you, like, I can break those berries very easily on a ketogenic diet. Whipped cream is keto friendly or low carb friendly. Berries are low carb friendly, but you put these two together, you'll eat until tomorrow. And so that there's, there's ways to break any diet. And, uh, and there's an individual response, I think. Not everybody has the same response I do. And one of the things yeah, that absolutely. you Absolutely. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the main sort of issues with the whole whole diet field is that you know if everybody's an expert with an nf1 and so that's why there's a lot of people who weigh in online and say you know i it's definitely this because you know this was my experience this is what i did 
And okay, those are all valid experiences, but they don't generalize. That's that's the problem. And so I think one of the big issues that we have in, in sort of dieting and obesity and nutrition science is appreciating that individual variability and trying to understand that individual variability. Because I, I think all, all the diet studies show it. I mean, if you look at diet fits, they've got some lovely waterfall diagrams in there where you know you, you see some people on, on a keto diet, on well, the low, low carb diet that they use, some people are losing 10 kilos, but other people are putting on two kilos. You know, so, and then it's exactly the same for the low fat diet. You know, there's the same pattern. So I think one one really interesting aspect of that is why why does that happen? And I think the the impression most people have is that the reason for that is adherence. So basically it's not possible. You know, that somebody could possibly go on a low carb diet and put on some weight. They must have been cheating. There has to be some kind of oh, we see it breaking all the time. of the diet. Yeah, we see it so, all the time. But, but yeah, that's our, it, yeah, our but most is common it, is it cheating? Is it cheating? No, 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 no. They're not cheating. We, I mean, so our most common consult is uh, I've done a low carb or hydrate diet and I'm not losing weight. What am I doing right. wrong? This is, I mean, right. maybe the second most common consult. And there are some recurrent themes that, that I've seen. In fact, we have over, you know, a thousand people on remotely monitored scales, all who've come to me saying, I want to do a low carbohydrate diet. And when we see their scales go, and we have remote uh, continuous glucose monitors, remote blood pressure cuffs, and we track this all remotely. And when we ask them, well, when they're gaining weight, when we see weight gain and we reach out and we say, how, how can we support you? How can we help you? Um, most of the time, most of the time, 99% of the time they report, they self-report stress. So I'm very oh, much really? interested. Okay. I'm, I'm very much. And when we look at their CGMs, um, very often they're not, they're not spiking their, their blood glucose, okay. which either means, you know, one of two things. Okay. Uh, the weight gain is due to some hormonal issue or their, their food reward system in that time of stress has gone to sweet and high fatty foods that don't spike their glucose. Um, so I don't, I don't think it's, well, there, there I think are there, some people. yeah, that there's two things we see that and lack of family support. So if their family's eating pizza every day, then it's a struggle for them. Right. So people we, do it as a couple. So, so you, your, your kind of view is yeah. that it's more adherence because they, you know, the, they break the diet because there's a lot of peer pressure and social pressure for them to take part in family events and that sort of thing. I think a lot of people break the diet just because their brains know how to, like, if you put me on vegan, I can, I can gain weight. I'll take Ezekiel bread, put peanut butter, cut up banana, put some maple syrup on it, and that'll be so fantastic. Let, let, me, let me tell you about the mouse experiment then. So... What we did with mice was we put them, we took out bread mice, so they're not genetically identical. And we put them all on a 30% calorie restricted diet. So these are individually housed. So there's no stress as such. They're not exposed to anything different going on over time. There's no interaction with other individuals. They absolutely cannot cheat on the diet because we provide the, the food. And what we find is a waterfall diagram exactly like diet fits. So basically some mice lose a ton of weight, some lose a bit of weight, and some actually gain weight, even when they're on 30% restriction. And what we've done with that experiment is we did it in males and females. So the beauty of that is we can then breed those together and we can look at how their offspring respond. And what we showed is that 50% of the response is genetic. So basically, we do all the controls. So we mate them together. We take the offspring. We swap the litters around so there's no maternal effects. But we track whose parents they are. And whether you gain weight or lose weight on the diet depends on whether you're, if you're a mouse, depends on whether your mom and dad also lost weight on the diet. So I think... There's, you know, there's not big adherence issues here, but there's probably big genetic compensation issues. So some people are just twin not going to lose weight. Too. Twin studies, yeah, so I know. Yeah, right. twin studies. Right. Kind so of like over a similar picture. Twins. Yeah. So, so I think the the key there is that it may not be 
you know, it may not be anything that you can do, do anything about. You know, it may just be genetically, some people are not designed to do keto. But the real question and that I think is, is if you put that person on a different diet, would they have success? Or are there just some people who genetically are rubbish at all diets? And other people who are genetically really good at all diets? Because if that's the thing, then there's never going to be any personalized prescription. Because the person who's rubbish at keto is also going to be rubbish at low fat. But if there is variability in that response, then of course you can predict. You can start to say, okay, let's do a genetic test and we'll tell you whether you should follow low carb or you should follow low fat or you should be going for a high fiber diet or a high protein diet or whatever. And I, I, that's where things are going, I think. Yeah, I think Jim that makes Johnson. the most sense. I think that makes the most sense because there's some people, like you say, if they're on a 30% calorie restricted diet, and it doesn't work and they gain weight like that's to us and when you look at calories in calories out you say well that argues against that very strongly right well in it does case. yeah but but i mean it it, it kind of does and and it doesn't because the way i explain that is there must be compensatory mechanisms in the metabolism Correct. so you know they they we're giving them 30 percent less food they're responding by expending 32 percent less calories and therefore they gain weight so just like the, the starvation all, studies and, and the overfeeding studies, that's what they've always shown. They've never gained as much weight as they should have, or they have never lost as much weight as they should right, have. Yeah, because there's compensation, because, because there's always compensation going on. And that's true, whatever manipulations we do. So if you look at exercise, if you look at weight loss on exercise, exactly the same pattern. You can bring people in, put them in a supervised exercise, so you know they've definitely done it. And some people lose five kilos and other people gain two. You, know, you think part of this, we're, we're not looking at, we're not differentiating a lot between visceral fat and subcutaneous fat. So I see people who are 300 pounds, 300 plus pounds, metabolically healthy, 0.8% 0, 0 or, or 0 0.8 liters of visceral fat. I see other people with 14 liters of visceral fat walking around. They're going to have a different response to weight right. loss. Yeah, absolutely. And also different metabolic health profiles. So I, I, th I think, you know, my, my personal feeling is that genetics has got to, uh, be factored into decision making about how we treat patients, but it's not just genetics because we could only explain 50% of the variance by genetics. So there's a lot of other individual phenotype factors of that that might be hormonal responses, it might be uh, meta metabolite responses, the way that those interact with the brain. There's all sorts of things that can be going on as well as genetics. One of the things that uh, Jason Fung talked about. Uh, just, just very recently, he talked about this uh, system of obesity. Um, and I, I very much uh, believe in this, like there's a matrix of obesity. Um, in, in fact, it's so insidious. You know, when you go to these obesity conferences and, you know, you, and, you know, just like I had the same feeling when I read uh, your op-ed with, uh, with Kevin Hall, they have these big diagrams um, you know, really underpinning all of the multifactorial processes involved in obesity, genetics, you know, psychological factors, socioeconomic factors, you know, maybe heat and cool and, you know, temperature regulation, and, you know, air conditioners, cars, et cetera, et cetera, the list goes on and on, and how they all interplay in these very complicated web of uh, interactions. And I think that this is the scientist's way of managing obesity. And just having been somebody who struggled with obesity, I kind of look at this and I remember looking at this, these graphs and, and I felt the same way when I read this, uh, this op-ed, you know, this interconnected web of things that could be better than the CIM. And I thought to myself, man, people just need a way out. They need a simple and easy way to manage hunger, right? Which is the big side effect of calorie restriction, I think. And they need a way to, they need a plan forward. You know, they need a plan forward. Yeah, I, uh, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I think the, the way that scientists attempt to understand these is to build models of, of the way that they think the system works. So this is all system thinking. So basically you're trying to work out what that diagram is and how that diagram works. And, and carbohydrate insulin model is exactly the same. I mean, that's a, a system model attempting to explain some observations. And I think one, 
one issue with the carbohydrate insulin model is it's kind of conflated with low carb diets. So basically, people have success on low carb diets and they think that's got to be it. That's got to be the carbohydrate insulin model that caused me to do that. But it doesn't have to be. I think that's the big problem that there can be many other reasons why low carb diets work that don't have to revolve around this carbohydrate insulin model. And that's, that's, I think, basically what the science piece was about is saying, well, you know, look, there, there are other ways that this can work. And the energy balance model, I think, actually is the model that probably most obesity researchers uh, believe and use in, in, in the research. So not necessarily uh, clinical applications, but in terms of just understanding how obesity works, I think most people would sign up for the energy balance model. It's a relatively small part of the field that believe in the carbohydrate insulin model. But, but yeah, if you're, that, that's if you're looking at the way to, uh, yeah, and I think if you're yeah. looking at the way to approach that, how I best approach that in a person saying, hey, look, if I'm hungry all the time, I'm always going to be eating. And if I'm eating processed food and Snickers and, you know, cereal all day, because what we're seeing is what I see generally, and I think this is the big thing about like what you were talking about with fasting. If, if, for instance, in the church, historically, they've always fasted. But if you're eating a bunch of high process, high sugar, and your insulin uh, levels are through the roof, it's hard to get your fat store. So they're miserable. So I've had people say they switch from a high carbohydrate diet to a, a, a carnivore type diet or a, a meat and vegetables type diet, low carb, and they're hungry for the first four days. They're ravenous. And then they fast. So the dean of the school I'm at, he fasted for two weeks, right? After, but the first three days he was struck. But once he went on his fast, he said, I wasn't hungry once in two weeks. It was weird. He, he thought it was really strange, but his insulin levels dropped like crazy. So sure. insulin it has some kind of a role in, in, in satiety measurement. So that's what I'm finding. My patients will come in and the natural progression that I think Tro and I see is people say, I'm never fasting. I'm not doing that. Okay, let's try to eat. Instead of five meals a day, let's try to eat three meals a day and see and cut out the snacking. They can do that. Then they say, okay, instead of breakfast, and I'm not even hungry at lunch, so I'll just move my breakfast and lunch together. So now they're eating two meals a day. And then yeah. sometimes they'll go to one meal or alternate day or whatever, and they say, I'm not really that hungry, so should I eat when I'm not hungry? What do I do? And they're trying to figure that out, too, because they're not. it's a new feeling for them not to be starving and thinking, I got to eat right now. I'm freaking out, right? So that's one of the so things. I'm, okay, so I mean, I mean I'm, what, what I'm saying is that that – Although you're saying it's because they're insulin spiking and that's what's driving the hunger, what I'm saying is it doesn't necessarily have to be that. So there are other mechanisms that are potentially involved there that are not necessarily involved in this postprandial insulin surge. So, so what I'm seeing, what I see a lot of times is people eat and then they're hung, they, they spike their sugars up. And this is what I'm seeing with the continuous glucose monitor. Then they eat, like they have cereal for breakfast, for instance, and orange juice and their sugar spike like crazy. Insulin goes up to get rid of their sugar. Then their sugar dips. Now they get in the red zone. They're hungry again. They get hypoglycemic and they say, I'm starving. So is that, that, the, insulin or the, is that the insulin or the sugar, Brian? I'm just going to call because I'm in well, the, the camp insulin that over the sugar, I think the right? insulin overcorrects. I think you overcorrect. So some so people, you, I think, I think some people are going to have a normal fasting insulin level, but when they eat, they overcorrect. They shoot their insulin really high. Sugar goes low as a result. But I never so see anyone eat eggs. They get hypoglycemic after that. I've never seen it yet. Have you? Okay, so 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 you're talking about postprandial shifts. So, correct. John, what, Dr. Speakman, what's your what's Just your take on? Yeah, what's your take on? Uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of data on this postprandial dipping. Uh, there yeah, was a study so in 8,000 you know, patients. If you look, you know. Yeah, if you look at uh, Ludwig's study on it, where he integrates all the all the meals of the day and he corrects for macronutrient composition, and then he's got high carb, medium carb, low carb, and what he shows is that you have uh, immediately after the meal, 30 minutes after the meal, the high carb ones, the glucose has gone higher than the low carb ones. And then there's a crossover point after about 120 minutes, and then they go the other way. So the ones that started out with the highest glucose go down to the lowest level. And, but, you know, the, the thing is that's really interesting about that study is they actually asked people how hungry they felt in the middle of the dip, and there was no difference. So, you know, okay, that physiology is happening. I think the problem is that the interpretation of that physiology into behavior is not necessarily correct. 
so basically you have some things going on with the levels of you know the the insulin response to glucose coming into the system is completely normal i mean i think one part of the problem is we've kind of medicalized that response as if it's something that shouldn't be happening but that's completely normal that's what should happen glucose comes oh. into your system you need to pack it away into the cells and you need to metabolize it and that's what insulin does is its job so i think i think it was the, i think it was why it uh, Wyatt Valdez, I, I have the study here. They, they looked at 8,000 people on CGMs, you know, 70,000 ad lib meals. Um, and they, they found that the postprandial dipping was associated with future energy intake and, and weight gain. Uh, now, that would, so then there's another study I've seen back as far back as 1999, where they looked at the, uh, they gave an identical shakes, isovolumetric, isocaloric, one is carbohydrate, one is fat. And they, they, what they were testing was this, the time at which they would request the next meal. And they showed yeah, that sure. carbohydrate shakes kind of lead to an earlier request versus a fat predominant shake. So I wonder if that physiology in the scent, in the, in an insulin resistant person, if that, and we know that, you know, I think it was, uh, um, Sinha, who showed that a 20 uh, point blood sugar drop activates those reward centers of the brain. It's not the insulin. So she had a euglycemic uh, 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 hyperinsulinemic clamp. So, so basically she had an insulin infusion and it wasn't the insulin infusion that caused those reward centers to get activated. It was that 20 point drop in blood sugar in the setting of high insulin. So do you think that you know, I, I, I'm a strong supporter that it's not necessarily the insulin, but the interplay between the insulin and the glycemia. I think there's yeah, a so lot I mean, of different I think data. There's, there's, there's quite a lot of experiments that have been done where, where insulin's been injected, the glucose drops, and that stimulates food intake. I mean, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of stuff on that. So the, the question in my mind is, though, is, is that an immediate response or is the regulation going on? So basically... You, there's a lot of interactions between meals within a day, but when you start to look at between day effects, there's nothing. So I think that's, that's where all the kind of Barbara Rose stuff ended up not really panning out because she had a lot of, you know, preloading people, looking at how much they eat in a meal, how much they eat in one meal. You know, if you increase the amount you eat at lunch, do you eat less at dinner and this sort of thing. And it's all within one day. But once you start to try and do those things from day to day, it all breaks apart. It doesn't seem to be part of the regulation system. So it seems that you know you can regulate your your meal to meal intake, but it's not particularly effective for regulating your total. And and you know I'm an energy balance guy, so it's total energy intake relative to energy expenditure. That's the key thing that's driving whether you put on weight or whether you lose weight. Yeah, I mean these are these are interesting concepts. You know, uh, I wonder I wonder if time is a factor, and I know you know, uh, people who are more uh, supportive of energy balance say that every low carb proponent wants more time. You know, I know, you know, in the studies and I know, I know that's commonly said as a trope, but I wonder if time is a factor. Um, when I look at the performance data for athletes and low carb diets, certainly we see a worsening in performance for anything under four weeks. I mean, you described it as yourself, the first four days of that fast, you wanted to like you had headaches and you want to stop. Um, so I think that there's some level of adaption uh, and we see disparate data that comes together to support this idea. Um, you know, the, the uric acid levels, you know, we can measure those and we can see them normalize towards two months. Sports performance seems to normalize towards two, two months. And David Ludwig showed that, you know, kind of later on, we may see some potentially see, and maybe you can, you know, help us understand the uh, follies of that, but you know, you may see these, uh, you know, uh, energy expenditure increases to, towards you know the five month time frame. So I'm a proponent that maybe there's something we don't understand, uh, particularly when it comes to adaption. Uh, do you think that this is like a low carb, you know, scapegoat, or do you think there's a merit to that? Yeah, so I mean, the joke, of course, is, you know, how long do you have to do a low carb experiment? It's two weeks longer than the experiment you did. So the, the problem is that, I mean, I think a priori, the prediction for a lot of these experiments, like, like the experiments that Kevin's done, is 
that there will be a change in energy expenditure. It's only after the experiment's done that there's somehow now it, it wasn't a long enough experiment. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a bit open-minded about it because, you know, of course it could be the case that it's, it's not long enough. The problem is those experiments are extremely difficult to do. They're inpatient experiments. You've got complete control of the intake. So what you gain in those experiments is you know exactly what the intake is. And so then there's no issues with, you know, they've, they've broken the diet, they've gone off piste and, and done something that, that they shouldn't have done. So, I mean, the, the beauty of Kevin's experiments is the control, the weakness is the duration. So David's experiments are completely the opposite. He's got very little control over what these people eat. They're prescribed these diets, but we don't really know whether they're following those diets. But he's, he could do it for much longer because of that. And, that, and I think that's, that's where the issue is with, with these data, is that it's not really possible to do a six-month inpatient study. And if it was, CGMs, I think a lot of these things would go away. Do you think CGMs will change the research in the low-carb space? And now that we can track adherence remotely uh, out, you know, out in the free world, uh, do you think that the continuous glucose monitors will change the scape, the, the scope of you know, here's, here's my problem. There was a great study. Oh, what's her name? Uh, my nemesis, my, my social media nemesis. I'm blanking on her name. So you have a, a lot of them, man. You got to narrow it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah, she's the dietitian leader. from, uh, she's a brilliant dietitian from, uh, from England. Uh, Nicola. Oh, what's that? Nicola. Yes. Nicola. Nicola yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So she did a very interesting study with continuous yeah. glucose monitors where she, uh, gave a graded carbohydrate diet and, uh, basically fed patients in an outpatient setting for a week to determine what impact does carbohydrates have on glycemia. And the first thing I did when I looked at the CGMs, I was like, these people are reading carbohydrates. Like you could tell right away, you know, uh, low carbohydrate adherence is, uh, I mean, the people on the lowest amount of carbohydrates, they just were, they were having glucose spikes. It, it, you know, I've, I don't think there's a doctor in the United States who's looked at more continuous glucose monitors than me, maybe I mean, got to be in the top 1%. Let's just put it that way. In terms of my ability to read, interpret uh, CGMs and the sheer volume we've looked at. And there's like three things that can cause glycemic excursions, you know, basically steroids, carbohydrates, you know, and acute stress, you know, of any kind can cause glycemic excursions. So either they're eating carbohydrates or taking steroids or all taking, you know, undergoing a similar stress. So I think, you know, wow, well, I don't mean to disparage her. It was a great study. I think it belonged in a war, an award, but do you think that this changes the landscape for outpatient testing? You know, you're doing this metabolic health clinic. Will you be using CGMs? So what I'm hoping to do is do uh, sort of residential studies like Kevin's doing, but do, do them over kind of longer durations. So that's the kind of plan at the moment, but we'll probably, uh, we probably will continuously monitor glucose in the, in the way that we'll continuously monitor other things. I think the problem with, with CGMs is that they're only one part of, of that macronutrient profile, aren't they? It would be great if we also had lipid monitors as well. So it would be good to see exactly what goes on after a meal, what, what's happening with those fluxes of lipids and what's happening with the fluxes of carbohydrates. I mean, I think the problem is they're, they're available and they're a good technological tool, but they only give us part of the picture. Yeah, I think uh, at least carbohydrate adherence you can get from, from them, um, you know, at the, at the least. Uh, yeah, which I think, I think makes them pretty useful. I think that's where we have to fine tune it because I like this lady, I told you she's about 300 pounds normal insulin, no, everything's normal in this lady, metabolically, when we look at her laboratories, triglycerides, HDL, everything's good. So in her case, it's going to be more of a calorie restricted diet, right? If I have someone with insulin through the roof, I'm, I'm limiting carbohydrates, and I see them drop those insulin levels like crazy, and I see clinical response to that. Because I'll tell you, um, Tro, I've never seen someone with high insulin levels that's not hungry all the time. And once we get their insulin levels down, I see that correlation. It may just be, may be just a association possibly. I don't know the causation, but I'm telling you. But, but are, we, are you talking about fasted it. insulin there or, or postprandial yeah. insulin? No, I'm talking fasting. about fasting. I mean, we haven't been following postprandial and, and I'd be really interested. He wishes to do that. he could. 
Brian, yeah, I wish I could. I wish we monitor. could do that. I think we had a, if we had yeah, a continuous continue. insulin monitor, I would love that, right? But we don't have that. And, and technically, people can't just sit here all day and eat and check their insulin level and come go to the lab all day sure. long. But what I'm finding is as the, you know, as an extrapolation, because I'm assuming just seeing what I'm seeing is the, it just based on our diabetics, we'll say, okay, you're eating lunch, how many carbs are you eating? Okay, you take this much insulin for that carb. Lunch, you're eating this many carbs. So if people don't, if they eat eggs for breakfast, how much insulin are they shooting? They're not. Right, they're not shooting. They don't need to cover their insulin. They're getting hypoglycemic. Yeah. My type ones have dropped about two thirds. On average, our type one patients adopting a low carbohydrate diet drop their insulin usage by about two thirds. Yeah, I'm, uh, and I'm seeing the but, same. But here's the flip side, Brian, and I'm sure you know Dr. John will love to 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 hear this. How many times have you seen somebody's insulin low, CGM flat, and they don't lose weight? Yeah. Absolutely. That absolutely happens. And then you have to start looking yeah. at that and saying, okay, what are we eating? If you're eating butter all day long, that's, that's why I'm making that point. If you eat 10,000 calories of butter, your ketones are going to look great. <laughs> Who cares? You're not going to lose weight at 10,000 calories a day eating butter, but your CGM is going to be completely flat. But by that yeah, same right. thing, so people are snacking That's on, what I'm saying. You know, yeah, you, exactly. you've got one part of the picture, you know, so if you had a lipid monitor, then, then you would immediately see what the problem was so. Well, also maybe a protein monitor, right? According to your research, yeah, right? right? Yeah, and I, and I think yeah, that's so. I mean, I, th I think that's what that's what you need. You need some some multi macronutrient uh, monitor so you can check what's happening with the fluxes of all these things. Where do you and think? And then uh, you need a calorie monitor. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the uh, <laughs> you know here's the problem. Here's I'm gonna I'm working on a uh, a lecture right now where calories fall apart um, for Cleveland Clinic. Um, and, and, you know, I'm looking over the data, whether we present calorie information on a menu, doesn't it change, doesn't impact, our, you know, uh, caloric intake, whether we give somebody a calorie app, doesn't impact caloric intake, whether we teach them about calories, educate them. And, you know, you know, it doesn't impact, you know, when we put it on the menus, even it doesn't impact intake. So I, I just wonder, I'm, I don't think doing the same thing with carbohydrates would matter either. Now everything shows net carbs and I don't think that it, it, it will impact it either. I just wonder as a public health tool, is calories useful at all? I think for science it's needed to some degree, but I don't think people need it. Well, I, I, I'm not gonna disagree with you, but I think as a, as a tool for understanding what's going on in obesity, it's absolutely essential. I don't think you can, if you cut calories out of the picture, then I think your understanding of what's happening is completely gone. Yeah, you know what I take? Fat mass and hunger. I take those two. Those two. That's the that's the end result, right? Everybody wants to be less hungry and lose fat. Right? Like those are the endpoints. You know, those are the endpoints I care about. Um, yeah. So I, I mean the question is how do you how do you get to those points? So I mean this is uh, a nice way to kind of introduce the differences between the energy balance model and, and the carbohydrate insulin model because they differ fundamentally in where hunger comes from. Okay, so basically, if, if you take the prediction of the carbohydrate insulin model, what it's saying is you eat some carbohydrates, your insulin spikes, that forces you to pack away circulating fuels into fat tissue, you get this dip in the circulating fuels, which, which incidentally is not only uh, carbohydrates, but also fatty acids as well. And then that puts you into this sort of notional starvation state. And there's two consequences of that. One is a reduction in energy expenditure, as you observe in normal starvation, and a hunger signal that forces you to eat more food and then you potentially get into this vicious circle of uh, you eat some more carbs that forces you then into another insulin spike and, and that's that as far as I am aware is what the carbohydrate insulin model is but you know as soon as we present that in the in the science perspective then suddenly that's not the model anymore there's there's something else going on so I mean is that is that not the model as you see it? Or is, is you know, what's wrong with that interpretation of the model? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm probably not most equipped to be able to talk about the specifics of the model. I, I defer to Jim Johnson, David Ludwig. Um, I defer to them. I, I have minor disagreements 
Like what, what do we know clinically? Clinically, I know if I give somebody insulin, they're going to gain weight. Okay. That I know, right? Clinically, I know if I cause hypoglycemia, I'm going to make somebody hungry. That I know. Okay. I suspect uh, from clinical observation, when we remove carbohydrates, there's a period of decreased energy expenditure for the first several weeks because people feel miserable. You told, you, you reported this yourself. Uh, that corroborates with the data that, um, you know, exercise performance is hindered, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But then there's this like, you know, magical zone somewhere between three to 12 weeks where people just spontaneously report decrease in hunger. And our clinical model here is just literally based off of that. And we've just published another uh, report on this. We published a case series on binge eating. We did one on hypertriglyceridemia, and, and which I think has to do with the hung, you know, hunger. We could talk about in an hour about that. But we just published one on diabetes reversal. And um, there's some, you know, there's a report by patients, and this is completely anecdotal and clinical observation, somewhere between three and six weeks, doc, I'm less hungry, right? And, and maybe and it, they're- It's almost yeah. universal. People say, I went out Friday night, had pizza, beer, cookies, all that stuff. I woke up Saturday, I was starving. I haven't felt that in a long time and I'm hungry all day. Like when we knew it from residency, if we were up all night in a stressful environment, eating terrible food and the next day you're starving all day and everyone said the same thing. And it was do I, just an observation we, before do we, we know this. Do we know this yeah, is but, true? But, I, I don't know what's, I don't know what's true. I just, I'm just telling I, you. I, I, I wouldn't disagree that it's, that it's yeah. not true because you're, you know, eating all this food, you're on that peak that we were talking about. Yeah. And so when you come off that peak, it doesn't matter which direction you come off it. You can go down to really low protein, really low carbs, or really low fat. But whichever way you come off that peak, you're going to see a reduction in hunger and intake. So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't doubt it that those, those things I, are correct. I, I think what we all agree on, it's complicated. It's not a simple, like, okay, just do this and it's going to work for everyone. I think that is what we kind no, of sure, all agree sure. on, right? Because Yeah, and, absolutely. And, yeah. and the underpinnings, you know, I, I, and the underpinnings, I think, you know, for me, the glycemic, uh, that, not the starvation response, so to speak, but the fact that, that glycemic excursions make people hungry, I think that's a strong basis for the low-carb world to start with, right, to, to focus in on, okay. you know, uh, probably best to focus on the hunger. Now, this increase in energy intake, I see it clinically. So when the clinical matches up with some of the science, then it gets me interested. So when we see 8,000 people with postprandial dipping, uh, making them hungry, and that's what patients report to me, you know, based on their own CGMs. Then, you know, when I minute, when I make that link of a clinical observation and a scientific underpinning, it makes it hard for me to say it doesn't exist. So those yeah, are but my the problem. The, yeah. the problem there is though that people are trained to understand these these monitors, you know. So the people that are wearing the monitors are not a random sample of people. They're given the monitor. They're told what what the interpretation of what's going on is. And so Correct. they see what they right. expect to see. And then as soon as they get a dip, they think I must be hungry because I've got a glucose dip and then they get hungry. So, you know, there's or the opposite, of other or, the, or the opposite is true. I see that quite frequently. People say, hey, I'm kind of hungry. They look at their sugar. It's 110. They say, well, I'm not, I can't be, it's not low sugar. I'm not hungry. And All right. The hunger goes away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so yeah, it can yeah, work yeah. the opposite way. Yeah. So there's, the there's a lot of psychology. Exactly. There's a with, ton with of psychology, psychology going on, but there's no doubt about it. And, just along the psychology, my PA's mom, diabetic, poorly controlled. She was embarrassed to tell me it was 13, her A1C. She got her a CGM. Now it's 6.8 because she could see it. No, any, no training, no carb. No one talked to her about it. They just, she would see certain foods and go, that's not good. I'm not eating that anymore. They, oh, I ate that. Not a problem. Okay, I'm going to stick with this. And she self-trained within three months to drop, drop her A1C by more than Ooh. half. And we know the longevity data on that. Maybe, that. maybe that's the thing also, having a feedback tool that's immediate. Maybe that's the key here is behavior change, making behavior change in humans stick. And maybe, you know, the use of continuous glucose monitors is just a quick behavior feedback tool, both for the doctor and for the patient. Um, and, and maybe yeah, that sure, makes but it you, unique. You know, you're only looking yeah. at one, one part of the, the picture, though, aren't you? And I think that's where the problem is, you know, and you've already said yourself, you know, that you can get a fantastic line if you, if you just eat butter all day. But that's not a healthy diet. You know, so the the issue there is what what are you trading off? You know, you're looking at one thing, 
and you're getting an answer and you're controlling one part of your life, but that may be creating lots of other problems in your diet. So I, I, th I think a more holistic picture of, of what you're actually doing with your diet is, is probably required than just spacing it all on continuous glucose monitor. That's why we have bioimpedance scales and blood pressure cuffs and routine lab work. You know, that this is, yeah, the, right, this is the right, joy of yeah. medicine. You know, the joy yeah. of medicine is being able right. to help people in a holistic way. Um, Dr. Speakman, so let me give you an alternative uh, model Perfect. for the way that I think it works, because I think there are some questions that uh, I think the carbohydrate insulin model can, can't answer. So the way that the energy balance model of, of energy regulation works is that you have energy demand. You are expending energy all the time. You expend energy when you exercise, but also when you're at rest. So what happens is your brain is integrating those demands and then you get a hunger signal to meet those demands. So basically you go out feeding because you've accumulated an energy deficit. And that signal can come from the fact that if you're not feeding, there's gonna be energy coming out of your fat stores or your glycogen stores. In some way, the brain is monitoring that imbalance between your expenditure of energy and the fact that there's no energy coming in. So that's where hunger comes from. And you go out into the environment and you seek food because of that. And then you're in a situation where you've eaten enough food to balance what you've had, or you've not eaten enough, or you've eaten too much. And the reason that you have fat is because there's a mismatch. There's always a mismatch between your expenditure and your intake. So you need a buffer. There's always got to be a buffer there because you can't feed 24 seven. You have to feed episodically, but your energy expenditure is constant. And so what happens is the brain is involved in that regulation. It takes those energy deficit signals, it takes signals of how much is in the fat, and that drives you to go out and eat. And so then you come into energy balance. Okay, so that's, that's what the energy balance model is. It's all run by the brain. It's all controlled from the brain. Whereas the carbohydrate insulin model is all run from the fat tissue. So basically the, the idea that Gary puts in, you know, his, his books, good calories, bad calories, and, and, and that is that, the reason that you get hungry is because of the amount of energy that you put into the fat tissue. So the more you put into the fat tissue, the more you have that starvation signal and the more hungry you get. Okay. So my question, and I've asked Gary this several times online, but he, he never sort of gives an answer is, why did that system this evolve? Question. I love this question. I've thought so much about it. When you posed this question, I said, yeah. this is a man of science, you know, and I thought <laughs> to myself, because, because nobody has really thought about that. And I had never heard anybody ask the question. And I think about this often. If you look at bears, right, if you look at bears who have this incredible hyperphagia, right, they eat, they eat an immense amount of carbs. They eat 30,000 calories in a day, right? How do they not get metabolically sick, even when we take them at their peak weight? and we do oral glucose tolerance tests on them, they don't have diabetes, right? right. And they walk out of, you know, and I, and I said to myself, well, why are we different, right? We're very genetically close to bears. Why are we different? Why do we get disease? Why does this go, go off? And this plays into your thrifty, you know, diverse thrifty gene. You know, one idea is that maybe insulin resistance is protective, you know, delivering high blood glucose would favor, you know, women who, you know, uh, who could support an offspring during famine. But then there's, there's issues with this whole idea of, you know, famines, you know, there, there's sometimes improved outcomes in famine. So there's conflicting evidence there. Um, I mean, it's not an easy question to answer. I wonder if insulin resistance is a foraging signal. I wonder, I wonder if it's part of the hyperphagia you know, how, phenomenal. you know, how, you know, it seems, it just seems a sort of crazy system to have, you know, if you, if you have a fat store, the function of that fat store is to buffer you against periods when there's, there's not food in the environment. And, you know, 
Gary, Gary said, yeah, that's what the function is. That's what it is. If you were setting that system up, you know, if I said to you, design a system to have a, a fat buffer, you wouldn't say, okay, well, we'll take one component of the diet and we'll have that control whether you get hungry and then you'll eat food and then you'll put on more fat with no relationship whatsoever to whether there's an energy deficit or not. I wonder it if it doesn't make way. any sense. Well, I wonder if it's the other way around. What if the environment is designed to control the animal, right? That, that's well, what environments I don't evolve. How do environments, environments don't evolve. Animals evolve well, I mean, to fit their environment. Well, so here's the other way around, right? The, 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 the bear will not eat a, will tend to not eat a unsweetened blueberry, an unripened blueberry. It'll eat literally, you know, 20,000 blueberries. It won't eat the unsweetened ones. It'll eat like the, the, the very sweet ones. So, you know, I wonder if there's an, and you talk a lot about this, how the environment, you know, whether it's temperature regulation, whether it's when you do your physical activity, what environmental underpinning affects how somebody eats or how somebody, how somebody expends energy. You know, I wonder if to some extent, uh, you know, here's a, a very basic example. I went to Costco, I bought a peanut butter jar and I left it out, okay? Uh, I left it out, I just forgot it out. Plastic wrap in plastic packaging, right? And the squirrel ate through the plastic, right? And ate the entire can of peanut butter, the entire can of peanut butter, you know, kind of similar to the pika, you know? And I just, I thought of the pikas when, when, you know, it ate the entire thing. Now, has it ever been challenged to chew through and consume some amount of plastic to get to food reward? No, it's no, never, of course it's never faced of course that, yeah. right? So is it environmentally, has it ever been genetically driven to chew plastic to get through, to get food reward? No, it's just been driven to get food reward. And so I wonder, yeah. So, yeah. so, so I in wonder, that situation though, you're, you're looking at a, at a situation where these animals are, are preparing for going into a period where, the, where there's no food supply. And so basically the braid is telling them, you need to get your fat stores up because you're not going to get through that period. Yeah, I but wonder the if it's more simple than that. I wonder if it's just like, you need to get awesome food right now, right? Like, I, I don't think, I don't know, you know, when I read about your, you know, your idea of thrifty versus thrifty gene, you know, it made so much sense to me that animal doesn't want to be fat, right? It doesn't want to be overly fat, it doesn't want to be diseased. Right, it doesn't want that, yeah. right? And why would it want that? But I wonder what kind of network of controls exist. And I, I brought this up to you online where we had this amazing study on uh, raccoons and raccoons in the cities very frequently get obese, diabetic and have inflammatory markers that are high versus raccoons that are in the kind of rural areas compared to the suburbs. It's like an immediate gradient. And the only difference is their access to our food. Right. Yeah, right. So, so, I mean, I think that the system, you know, the problem is that you're dealing with a system that it, it's trying to deal with the modern world. And that's, that's, that's like humans as well. You know, we, we're, you know, we, we've in, inherited our metabolism from 4 million years of evolution, but we're not prepared for donuts and pizza. And so the problem is how we deal with those things. So, the, so there's two kind of different things. One is why do we have fat? One is why do we not regulate it very well? And those are kind of different questions. So if we were wild animals, we, it would all be cost benefit. So it would all depend on what the benefits are of depositing a bigger fat store against the disadvantages of doing that. And in wild animals, that's principally a starvation predation trade-off. So you regulate how much fat you need according to what your risk of starvation is and what your risk of predation is. So if you take your squirrels, then it's better for them as they approach the, the sort of winter period when some of them are going to go into hibernation and other ones are going to just go into this sort of estivation type state. They, it's better for them to pack on as much fat as they can because they know that period's coming when they've got no, they've got no food available. Can I pause you for one sec? Do they really know? Are they, is it a frontal lobe no. process? No, it's like a, of course not. So that language it's, a re is... it's reward center driven. So basically yes. they, yep. 
you know, they, the, the upper intervention point that controls how much fat they store is moved up. And so then they, they've got levers that are pulled that say you need to go and eat food, but there's nothing stopping them from eating more. And so basically they go up in body weight and they go up in body fatness. And it's, it's dependent on what food's available in the environment. So if there's more food available in the environment at that stage, then they're going to put on weight. But I bet you, if you take it in the middle of the summer, your raccoons are not doing the same thing. There's probably no they're difference not. between between your summer ones and, and between your rural and your urban ones because they're not in the same physiological state. So you can understand all that in terms of energy balance and what they deposit in the fat for and what the selection pressures are. The, the energy balance model can do that. The carbohydrate insulin model can't do it. They can't explain what's, you know, the, the evolutionary background to why they're doing what they're doing. But maybe it explains hyperphagia to some extent. Maybe those glycemic excursions are part of that hyperphagia foraging process. Like it, maybe it is a part of that system to drive an animal to eat, right? But the carbohydrate, remember the carbohydrate insulin model is that carbs come in, the fat packs it away. It's not, it's got nothing to do with them attempting to, to put on fat. It's all driven by the environmental supply of carbs. That's the carbohydrate insulin model. And it makes I, zero sense in terms of evolution. I just, I, my, my heart of hearts, there's some parts of the CIM that I, I very much agree with. I just think the underpinning of glycemia driving hunger, that seems very attractive to me. And I wonder when you pose that question, what is the evolutionary purpose of the CIM? Why did it exist? I think of two things. One, being able to deliver higher glucose in periods of famine, um, or even blood, blood lipids in times of famine. In fact, I have in incredibly insulin, res I mean, we, we know this, for example, in hemochromatosis, high, fer high ferritin levels and iron overload are a disadvantage in our modern world but they also increase your VO2 max. It would have made you an amazing athlete and sprinter, right? Mm -hmm. So a disease in our modern time may be an advantage in another time. Um, and so I wonder if the carbohydrate insulin process uh, and its involvement in hunger has to do with that hyperphagic single, has to do with food reward, has to do with stimulating animals to eat more when food is available to them. Um, that's, so I... That's, I yeah. My, my feeling is that, that we've been kind of misled that postprandial insulin is the same as fasting insulin. And I think a lot of that kind of, you know, this idea that, that carbs stimulate insulin and therefore that insulin must be doing exactly the same as what basal insulin is doing. I think that is part of the disconnect in that model. I, I, I really think we don't fully understand what's going on there. And I think that's an issue with the carbohydrate insulin model. Here's, here's another question that I think carbohydrate insulin model cannot explain in the slightest. So if I take a mouse, it's in the room here at 21 degrees. If I stick it in a fridge at four degrees, within an hour, it starts eating more food. Okay. Now I can explain that absolutely completely with the energy balance model. How do you explain that with the carbohydrate insulin model? It's just completely yeah. impossible. So, so you're absolutely right. There's other things that we don't know, you know, uh, um, mitochondrial on, you know, uncoupling or decoupling, the, you know, the temperature thermogenesis. Um, you're absolutely right. There's things beyond carbohydrate and insulin. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, but that, that they're we, not that, beyond that energy balance. Well, you know, energy balance, the, the tough part of it, is I, when I saw this, I'm like, I think they all have, <clears throat> excuse me, I think they all have troubles. None of them, I, we can all give examples of why the energy yeah. balance, like you gave the example earlier about how the energy balance doesn't always add up either. So there's other factors. We have to look, maybe it's a combination of the two, right? Maybe but when, not, okay, when not, does energy not balance not add up? I don't, I don't know what well, you're When we to. went to the mice eating 30% less calories, Right. It, it, yeah, but but they also expend thirty two percent less energy, and so that's why they put on weight. There's no there's no magic disappearing yeah. of or, or appearing of calories here. Yeah, I think so. They well, compensate. Well, so well, yeah, you so, can exactly, but you can compensate metabolically also, right? So if I if I, if I eat two thousand calories of gummy bears versus 
2000, if I'm a diabetic and I eat 2000 calories versus of gummy bears versus 2000 calories of salmon, you don't think there's going to be a difference in that? Not yeah, of course there is, safe. because, you know, some salmon accelerates your metabolism because of the protein effect on your metabolism. So you'd have to eat 2,600 calories of salmon to get the same amount of calories that's available for your metabolism. I think, I think yeah. where we're going to here is from a science, scientific perspective to explain models and effects, calories are quite helpful. Yeah, as absolutely. A, as, a, as a clinical tool... Uh, I would say energetic. indisposable. Yeah, and in terms of but, the but clinical, a clinical tool, they may be completely rubbish. Bingo. That's it. I think this is the main disconnect uh, between the two camps. Um, you know, it, it is a clearly helpful to understand those underpinnings when it comes to modifying behavior change in an environment that makes urban raccoons obese. I think, you know, like the, the billboards and the air conditioners and the, uh, you, know, you know, refrigerators and the advertisements in the city and the calorie for information on all of the menus, I don't think it affects those raccoons, right? So when we're talking about, you know, wanting Except to- Except indirectly by what people put in the, in the rubbish bin. Yeah, ex exactly. What I mean is, um, these things that we, when I look at these models of obesity at these obesity conferences, I think they are interesting from a scientific perspective, very limited in their actual clinical utility and pu the public health utility of calories. I I'd even say it's probably harmful. Now the scientific use is absolutely incredible. Um, you, know, that, so that's, I, I, you know, that's my personal belief, you know? Um, I think it's, guys, it's a tool though. Okay, go ahead. No, no, you get the last word. We brought you here. We're, we're humbled <laughs> to have you here. This has been a great, so you get the last word, final word. Uh, oh, you put me on the spot now. I don't, I don't yeah. know what to say is my, my final thing. I mean, I, I yeah. think, I, I, you know, there's a lot of common ground there in terms of, you know, the, these energy balance models I, in my world are completely essential to understand what's happening. And, and I can't, I can't reconcile aspects of the carbohydrate insulin model with the things that I need for a model to be successful. So if it can't, you know, if you can't explain how it evolved and you can't explain phenomena that I see, then I think it's not a particularly great model. However, if a simple rule like eat less carbs is successful, I can absolutely see why that's clinically much more important than people trying to count calories. So, you know, I, th I think these are just two completely different worlds. I would say though that, you know, the, the clinical tool of eat less carbs doesn't have to work through the carbohydrate insulin model. So the fact that it works doesn't say anything about whether that model's correct or not. I think uh, you brought up some very interesting points. This has been an awesome yeah. discussion. Brian, I know is like biting I'm his tongue. And so, no, no, I and, love it. No, I love know. it. I wish I didn't have to go because <laughs> I love it. Because I, I agree. I think there's more to the story. And I think there's, I think we're going to learn a lot with all the good work you're doing and the good work we're doing clinically. Because I think when we put these together and say, okay, that's sometimes it's got, that's nice, but I can't lock my patients up in their rooms. They don't have stress and sit there and eat the same thing every day. And no one's going to do that. So yeah, that's exactly. part of it. And, and part of it is saying, hey, look, you know, there, there are stress components and a lot of people eat when they're not hungry. So hunger is not the only component. There's a lot that we're looking at, but what I'm, what I see is clinically, I don't see people binging on butter and say, I'm going to just go eat butter. Cause I'm just going to eat like crazy. But I do see people binging on cotton candy and, and ice cream and popcorn and, and flavored stuff. And so I think there's, there's so much of the story that we, we, we really just have to figure out how much is a lot of people have the knowledge base, but doing it in practicality is the hard thing. Like, how do I do it in real life? And I think when we combine those things, I think we're going to learn a heck of a lot and be able to help people. Yeah. Sure. Dr. Speakman, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Patreon supporters, thank you for donating to our Thanks for not for profit uh, or not for, for not for profit podcast. Thank you, Dr. Speakman. If somebody wanted to find you on social media, you know, um, I think it's at John Speakman Four, right? That's right. Yeah. Right. So you can message him right there. And anything we should be uh, interested to see that uh, that's coming our way from from your lab or from your work, anything that you can tip us to. 
Yeah. So in uh, what what time is it there in the U.S. Uh, Eastern time? Ten forty one a.m. Ten forty one. Okay. Yeah. So in three hours, we're going to have a paper in science released. That'll be great. That'll be great. That'll be very. So interesting. look forward to, wait to see it. All right. I'll keep an All eye right. out. Have a good one. Okay. Hey, thanks for good. joining us. We really thanks for staying up late for us. We appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. Good stuff. Thanks for changing the time for me. I enjoyed the chat. I think that's great.